Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stand the Energy Man on this great Aloha Friday. We got volcanoes happening on the Big Island with plenty of energy in them that we'd like to tap into someday. And uh, thunderstorms all around us, which have a lot of energy in them. So we're, we're just full of energy here in Hawaii this week. But uh, some of the most exciting news that's come out, uh, came out yesterday, uh, and it came out nationally, in fact, internationally. Um, if you'll recall, last week, Friday, I had Trevor Milton from... Um, to, uh, to, uh, Nikola Motors uh, over on the mainland. Um, he talked about his 18-wheeler uh, uh, hydrogen power trucks that'll do between 600 and 1,200 miles on one fill-up of uh, hydrogen. That's about 100 kilograms of hydrogen on board. Um, they announced yesterday that they've signed their first contract um, for a fleet, uh, complete fleet changeout. And the company they're going to be changing out is all the fleet trucks for Budweiser, Anheuser, and Hauser Busch. So they're going to be providing 800 of these hydrogen fuel cell trucks to Anheuser Busch, and uh, I got to say that's that's pretty bold, and it's an exciting move for the hydrogen community, and we're looking forward to those trucks hitting the roads on the mainland, and hopefully even sending some out here. It's not like we don't drink any beer out here, um, so we could probably use a couple of those trucks out here, and we'll have a station up to run and fill them up. But it's uh, it's been an exciting week in the hydrogen world, that's for sure. And uh, today we've got an, an interesting uh, discussion. We have uh, Mark Ware from Ohm, Technolo Ohm Energy Technologies. Um, they're over on Maui right now, but they're actually a, uh, a big company that, that started on the mainland. I'll let Mark talk about all that. And um, we'll talk about an interesting thing. As you all know, the first step that you do when you're trying to go to clean energy is you go for efficiency. And that means you try and reduce your energy costs and your energy requirements to the minimum, then switch to the clean technology rather than just build to the dirty technology loads. And so what Mark does and what his technology does is helps, uh, especially with large companies and companies that have a lot of um, motors or big, uh, big surge capacities on their systems to save energy. And he'll explain how all that works. So Mark, welcome to the show. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate you being on uh, and, and uh, talking to me this week about your technology. It's been an amazing learning curve Hello, for me. Yeah, thank you for having me here today. Hey, tell us a little bit about how you got into doing what you're doing, and um, and then let's talk a little bit about your company. Well, uh, if you really want to go back to the beginning, uh, maybe three, four years ago, my wife decided that uh, Maui was the place that we wanted to uh, move our family. And we had a, uh, a small farm just outside of Boise, Idaho, and uh, uh, we were vacationing here at, at one particular time, and and uh, so we were contacting a, a company that was interested in um, uh, you know some representatives and and some people to help uh, develop uh, something that really was a, a novel idea, and I didn't realize the uh, uh, the involvement with uh, a, a major player, General Electric. And, and so we took a trip to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, literally the next weekend, and it was uh, April of uh, 2014. And we took a tour of the, uh, the factory, met with the inventor, and um, had you know, kind of a, uh, a crash course on what this actually does and, and uh, how it uh, uh, is utilized in large facilities. And uh, at that time, General Electric had already been involved uh, 12 years doing all the early studies and uh, along with other agencies that uh, conducted their own laboratory studies of uh, uh, the powerhouse, and that's, that's what it's called. And uh, what the uh, powerhouse does, it just it boosts levels and maintains voltage across all phases, no matter the load. And for a facility that has to uh, uh, keep everything, uh, keep all their motors and induction uh, equipment uh, happy, they have to keep the uh, uh, the voltage uh, boosted and elevated, and otherwise you're going to be using a lot of current that's uh, going to burn them out. And so uh, uh, anyway, uh, this, this technology really intrigued me, 
And uh, so then uh, we got more involved with it. And, and uh, uh, in the four years, we've seen a, a real evolution. Uh, a lot of people were working together to uh, really develop it to what it is today. I have a team in Southern California and on the East Coast that uh, have developed a, a, another side of our technology so that uh, whatever the powerhouse does to a facility, you can remotely access and evaluate exactly what's going on at any given facility uh, without having to go to the panel, you could be around the world and still know what's going on at the facility. I mean, it, this, this is all uh, technology that is just mind-boggling today. We're the first to, to have uh, the, the, at least the monitoring part of the technology, and uh, uh, it, it's really been an exciting time for us. And so so what gave you the background to go? I mean, what kind of education do you have the, that kind of well, brings you into this world? Originally, I wanted to be a concert pianist, so uh, I studied piano uh, from a young age, and when I was a teenager, I went to the Juilliard School of Music for pre-college. Uh, but my grandfather, who was a real influence in my life, uh, was a noted uh, uh, faculty physics professor at Oregon State University, and so I, I spent summers over there uh, visiting them and, and you know watching my grandfather do all of his uh, experiments, and and he actually knew Tesla from uh, Nikola Tesla from the 1920s to his death in uh, 1943, and. Uh, uh, was interested, in, and I didn't realize it at the time. Of course, I was, you know, eight, eight to ten years old. But uh, you know, all that stuff really intrigued me, and I, I remember him telling me things that uh, I didn't appreciate as much then as I do now. Uh, just, just how valuable of a man that Tesla was, and, and so uh, uh, you know, a lot of times he would uh, uh, teach on that. Uh, uh, on that line of uh, education with, with his students uh, and carry that legacy. And so that carried with me to University of Oregon where I studied physics as well as piano performance. But the physics end of it uh, carries on today. And, it, it, you know, I, I always learn and I always uh, kind of go back to my roots and, and uh, you know, just always have an open mind to things and, and uh, you know, with, with uh, uh, education and, and uh, reading, then you become uh, a little more versed in, uh, you know, some of these new technologies that come out. It's always amazing to me when you really start getting to know somebody and talk to them about the the diverse backgrounds that they have and, and how their paths through life take twists and turns. And uh, the, fa the fact that your grandfather actually worked with Nikola Tesla is uh, a huge thing and to have well, a knew it. him. I, I don't know for sure if he actually worked with him, but they were uh, they were colleagues, uh, especially when uh, Tesla was working uh, with the U.S. government. And uh, my grandfather was uh, 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 in the Bureau of Mines as well, and so he was one of my grandfather was one of the world's leading authorities on nickel, cobalt, and platinum, and uh, you know would lecture all over the world. So he got to know a lot of people in the so-called industry, and uh, Tesla was one of them. Wow, that's amazing. Well, let's talk a little bit about your powerhouse, and we'll pull that first graphic up to kind of show, and, and why don't you describe to us what it is that the powerhouse does. Uh, I know you talked about uh, trying to boost voltage, and maybe you could start off with an analogy of why the Europeans and other countries tend to use 220 versus 110 volt for their main, uh, you know, distribution in the residential and, and commercial buildings. Sure. Um, in the on the mainland and, and on the island in the U.S., um, uh, the U.S. has their own um, uh, their own standards on on voltage, and it happened to be 208 and 480 here, and, and as well as uh, 60 uh, hertz. And um, so, in order to work with that, uh, you know, there are some uh, some technologies that utilize more DC than AC. 
And DC having uh, the characteristics that you can manipulate the power more easily, and, and uh, that's why uh, uh, they can work on uh, uh, some uh, technologies can work on less power, and, and that's where uh, variable frequency drives come into play uh, because it's basically an AC-DC converter, and because DC is used as the inductant current for any motor, you can you can adjust and manipulate the amount of power, and if you do it right, you can reduce the power in, in motors uh, even half, by half. And so, um, but that creates problems. And so, what the powerhouse does, it uh, number one, other than boost level and maintain the voltage, lowers the amps since. Volts and amps have a reciprocal relationship right. to each other. So if you raise the raise the volt, uh, amps will lower. And conversely, if, if uh, you lose uh, volts, then the amps come up, and uh, amps is heat. And so any any time you throw more heat at something, uh, you're going to burn out that equipment or or a component. So. Uh, um, that's why it's uh, very important to just make sure you have the voltage, which is pressure, and then you have uh, amps, which is you know the the floodgate uh, wow. to let all the electrons in. And so, um, uh, but secondly, what the powerhouse does, uh, uh, it uh, there there's a, a, a amount of power that's uh, in the neutral. Uh, whenever you have motors, you have to have a certain amount of power to uh, keep the magnetic fields going. Right. That is called reactive power, and it's totally necessary. It's not utilized in, uh, you know, in that AW, which is what you're built for, is the work uh, the motor does. Reactive power is to keep the magnetic fields going, and it goes through the neutral, but uh, what our patent does, we collect that power in the neutral, utilize it uh, as a secondary power source, recycle and return it for use within the facility. Otherwise, it goes to, to ground or uh, it, it even bounces back uh, to the utility distribution line uh, to go somewhere else. And, and as you know, island power is not designed for power to bounce back into the system. Right. It creates hiccups and interruptions, and that's something that you don't want to do. So you're actually helping out the utility as well by kind of helping smooth some of their power out and then not getting that bounce back. Yeah, especially by going to the larger consumer of power. So when, uh, okay, for instance, we did uh, one main plaza, which is the uh, federal building uh, in Wailuku here on Maui. And it's a six-story uh, structure, and it houses uh, the water department and IRS and a uh, few other uh, agencies. And, and uh, so uh, but it's one of the largest power users in the area. So if you make things really nice as far as uh, volts uh, and uh, uh, to uh, uh, take care of whatever line surges and sags, that could come about uh, from starting uh, motors and, and uh, engines within the uh, facility, then we're making the, the neighbors happy because we're not, uh, that facility is not creating a uh, disturbance. And I, I so, assume from this, and you talked to Miko and Hawaiian Electric, uh, and they're they're familiar with what you're doing, or is it is it kind of yeah. new to them and kind of exciting to them because they don't they don't have anybody doing this re regularly out here? A couple of weeks ago, I had a meeting with Sharon Suzuki, Mike Ryder, and Alan Babayan. Uh, and uh, Sharon is the president of Miko, and the idea of that meeting was not to have a utility company endorse us uh, because they can't. I mean, we're, we're in military bases in uh, on the mainland, um, and we had uh, DOE and DOD uh, come out from Washington, D.C., and even uh, government agencies can't endorse us as a product. And so the whole idea for the meeting with Miko was to let them know that the technology exists, 
that we're here on the island and um, that we're here to stay. And uh, so that uh, uh, if they hear about us, then uh, they, they know exactly what we're doing. Okay. Well, I tell you what, Mark, we're about halfway through the show here. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with uh, Mark in about 60 seconds. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to come visit with us on Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey where we explore and examine the plant that the muse has given us. And stay with us as we explore all of the facets of this planet on Wednesdays at noon. Please join us. Aloha. Hi, I'm Pete mcginnis Mark, and every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me, one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan, the energy man here with Mark Ware from Ohm Energy Technologies uh, over on Maui. Uh, but they're not just on Maui. They've, they've got units all over the place. So no, I've got two questions for you right off the bat, number, and they're both number questions, about how much sure. is the average savings that a, a big uh, user like um, the uh, federal building there on Maui, what's the average um, savings that those folks get from your unit, and how many units do you have out there nationwide? Uh, nationwide, we have over 700 units, and uh, last uh, uh, Labor Day weekend, we installed at uh, Toyota Manufacturing, their aluminum parts plant in Missouri. Uh, we're in Procter & Gamble, Lever Brothers. Uh, our biggest client right now is uh, John Q. Hammonds, which is uh, NBC Suites Resorts. And uh, a lot of that, uh, the resorts, it, it's spilling over to the islands. I currently have uh, data loggers at a couple of uh, large resorts right now uh, with more going in. So uh, we'll make an impact on that basis. And the other question that I, uh, uh, could you repeat that? Yeah, but what's question? the average savings for the, when you install this for a large customer? What kind of energy savings are they looking at? Well, um, Conservatively, I say 10 to 20 percent, um, and that's usually the range that, that we see. At uh, one main plaza, um, we've reduced, uh, I'm looking at between 9 to 12,000 uh, 12, kWh per month. And uh, so th that's pretty significant. And, and we've seen, uh, we did one in uh, Florida at, at a, a beacon injection molding company, and we reduced the KWH by 84,000 KWH wow. per month. And wow. at Toyota, um, it's in the hundreds of thousands of uh, KWH per month for reducing the bill. Yeah, and here and locally, that's, that's, that's quite a bit of money considering we're kind of hovering around the 30 cents a kilowatt hour price. You, you basically you're right. take you're that totally nine, right. nine, 9,000 9, or whatever, and now you're talking $2,000 a month on your electric bill for a, a well, company. Well, three grand, three to 4,000 a month. Right. So it's, it's pretty impressive. That's big. Yeah. The, uh, the resorts that we are uh, hopefully going to get into, um, it, it's going to dwarf that uh, significantly. All right. So the other piece of your technology that's, um, that's like part B of your uh, powerhouse is the monitoring piece. And what is that? I mean, other than being able to real time look at your data from any location in the world, you know, what are some of the other advantages? I know that you've, you've had interruptions at certain facilities and, and, you know, it's a mystery like, gee, why did this piece of equipment fail? But your monitoring actually helps do some sleuthing to figure that out. 
Well, the, the main thing is uh, generally when when they need to get it, it get to the panel and see what's going on, you have to open it up and, and uh, hire electricians and all that. Well, everything's been placed to where, uh, you know, I can go on uh, any locations that we have installed and I can see what's going on at the facility. I can see what improvements we need to make if we need to add uh, other capacitor banks. I mean, for instance, uh, I mean, even though uh, we're at 98% efficiency at one main plaza, we're going to install another capacitor bank and we're going to hardwire it into the uh, powerhouse so it's on 24-7, uh, but we're going to get it up to 99.5% at all times. And, uh, you know, that's unreal. Uh, it, we blow in engineers away when we're able to do that pretty readily. Okay, we're going to throw up that second image um, and look inside the cabinet there. So right now we have the image up where we've got the panels open and we're looking at the blue uh, units around the side. Can you kind of give us an idea yeah. what's going on there? Okay, well those, those uh, the, the blue is the MOBs, which are metal oxide varistors. And the goal of the metal oxide varistors is to transport the electrons either to storage capabilities like to the capacitors or distributed within the facility and so it's always a two-way street and that's all they do um, and uh, where by themselves it doesn't sound like they do much but uh, the amount of current that they're able to, to handle each of those uh, uh, blue MOVs uh, can handle up to a hundred thousand amps wow. and it, it's huge, and so wired in parallel, you know, of course you accumulate the amps when you uh, wire in parallel. You have 600,000 amps per phase. So it'll handle any size facility, any amount of power uh, that it can take. And uh, we've had a, a couple of instances, uh, in fact, one of them here on Maui, where uh, the business, uh, the line was hit by lightning, and our powerhouse uh, did everything it was supposed to do and protected the building from uh, uh, some major damage. And they had just purchased a couple of new chillers. This was at uh, Stopwatch Bar and Grill. And this was two, three years ago that this happened. And, and uh, all it did was knock out uh, two of the MOBs, and uh, GE sent them out. We put them back in, and, and they've been up and going for about four years now. Wow. So it actually helps protect equipment, too, besides smoothing the power and giving real-time feedback on what's going on in the system. Um, it actually helps protect the equipment from outside surges as well as manage inside surges. And again, you, you say this technology is particularly advantageous when you have a lot of things like big compressor motors or chillers or you know things that are have big surge um, surge rushes uh, on your power system. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, the other thing it does, it it, it pre prevents line surges and sags to occur as the power is being dis, uh, distributed by the utility company. Now, uh, I, I have to say, uh, you know, having said this, that uh, at the meeting with Nico, one of the first things that came out of my mouth was uh, how impressed I was, in particular with Maui, uh, how nice of a system we have here for power distribution. And I, I know uh, uh, by the look on their faces, they weren't expecting me to say that, but I did preface it by uh, saying for island power, and it's pretty amazing uh, that we can be 2,500 miles from uh, you know uh, a big piece of land and still have the power distribution and really you know something that's pretty efficient um, but what our equipment does it just makes it so much better so that uh, uh, we can we can enjoy the same efficiency uh, just like on the mainland and you know the mainland they, they have their own problems too so you know we're not the only place in the world with uh, with power problems well, I'm, so, sure, I'm sure uh, the, the Miko folks when they talk to you 
were surprised because, you know, I had this experience about two weeks ago. We provided the power for an outdoor event using hydrogen fuel cell generators. And I went up to each person that was plugging stuff in, asking them what their equipment required for power. And I got the deer in the headlights look because they had no idea. They're just so used to plugging oh. stuff into the wall. And to have somebody that really right. understands the power requirements out there like you do, probably got their attention pretty quick. Well, the, the fact that they they have two uh, huge generators that they procured in the 1980s from uh, Langley, Virginia, from the CIA facility there, and those are those bad boys are, are some of the you know best generators you can get. And we we have two of them here on Maui, and I do know that uh, uh, Wahoo has uh, uh, some you know, pretty nice generators there as well. That uh, uh, you know they were not surprised; uh, they they were surprised with me coming out and praising the system that they have. It's just that you know we're here to make it better. Well, I tell you where we're winding down to the end of the show, and I'm going to give you some time on your own, but because you mentioned the word hydrogen before we went on air, I'm going to ask you to, to talk a little bit about your view of what hydrogen's role is in the future for, uh, for transportation and for grid power, just because I know you've done a little bit of that work, and then I want to leave the, list, the rest of the time to you to just wrap up uh, whatever you'd like to for Ohm. Oh, sure. Uh, thank you. And uh, um, hydrogen, uh, since it's so easy to produce, uh, you know, I was working with that a few years ago, uh, working on a system for homes and cars. And, and then when this uh, opportunity came up, uh, you know, it just kind of took a, a back seat to that. But uh, hydrogen, uh, you know, has it's totally clean. Uh, the, there's no emissions. It's just water. And uh, the only thing that uh, uh, we have to be careful of is, is uh, uh, making sure that the electrolyte in that is uh, uh, you know, safe to use. You don't, uh, you don't want to use a lot of lye, and, and if there's uh, you know, other materials that uh, will not impact uh, the environment, uh, especially on an island, you, we have to keep everything uh, contained here, and we don't want to contain anything that's going to harm the uh, uh, harm the atmosphere or uh, uh, the the land. And so we have to really respect uh, this area. So uh, if produced cleanly, uh, hydrogen is the way to go. Yeah. I'm telling you, it, it's great. Well, the the new PEM electrolyzers don't use any kind of. Uh... Uh, caustic um, electrolyte in them, and the new alkaline electrolyzers, like you said, that use lye, use a very, very low concentration that's not even, I mean, you can get it on your skin and, and go walk over and wash it off and you won't get any any kind of uh, issues from it. Right. But um, I'm gonna, we got about a minute left, and I'd like to leave the last minute up to you to just talk about, uh, you know, what it is about your technology you think uh, we should be looking at here in the islands. Well, I, I think, uh, like you mentioned, hydrogen is, is the way to go. Um, it, but, you know, you, you have to remember that every technology that we have, we're still going to be grid tight. The grid is not going to go away. It's just uh, the, the vehicle and the resources to uh, be able to provide that artery and capillary uh, action to uh, you know, facilities and homes and, and all that. Uh, we, we have to work together. The powerhouse works with all technologies, wind, solar, VFEs, uh, anything like that. It just has to be grid tied. And uh, so uh, any new technology that comes about, the powerhouse can be a, a part of that uh, uh, part of that plan. Well, Mark, I, I really thank you for being on the show today and uh, and talking to us a little bit about your technology. It was an eye opener for me. I learned a lot talking to you this week, uh, getting ready for the show, and I'm actually pretty excited f to get this thing on YouTube because, um, you know, I think for some people looking at the powerhouse is like a dog watching TV. Um, if you're not an engineer, or especially an electrical engineer, but I can tell you, my electrical engineering friends are going to watch the show and and it's going to blow their socks off. Um, so I really appreciate you um, 
explaining it and even explaining it to the point where I can understand it because I'm, I'm not an engineer and uh, I think you did a great job and I'm looking forward to seeing that energy savings kick in and all the other qualities that your, your equipment does for folks and I hope you got some meetings over here with Hawaiian Electric on Oahu and you can do a lot more of the, um, the big issues over here because we got a lot more heavy pulling uh, loads over here on Oahu than they do on Maui so get over here and start squaring I these guys away. I have done a project on Oahu at the Pacifica building on Kapiolani Boulevard, and one of our systems is in there. In fact, the picture you have, I believe, is from uh, the Pacifica. Okay, Mark. Well, thanks a lot for uh, being with us this week, and we'll have to have you back on the show. Maybe next time you're over here on Oahu, uh, we'll, we'll get you on in person, and we won't have to, have to bring you in via technology. But thanks for being on the show today and explaining everything, and thanks to Robert and Cindy here in the studio for making all the magic happen. And uh, this is Stan Osterman uh, for Think Tech Hawaii, and we'll see you next week Friday. Aloha.